you want to turn that light on someone there for these before you when you give them out the lessons with Antonio turn the light on in there for them <coughs> we're going to be in the fifth chapter of Ephesians tonight this will be our 66th lesson there's a certain progression in this epistle I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in salvation we've been we've been called into a, a, a participation with God we're part of something that's happening well, I know we've, we've talked about this a lot and perhaps it's very evident to you, but you can no doubt remember one like it wasn't so evident. Now this uh, idea of being called in to participate, you're part of, you're an active part of something that's going on. You're not just someone that is being acted upon. You're someone that's responding and participating and expressing. Now this is expressed a number of ways in scripture. For instance, when people were saved, Acts 5.14 says they were added to the Lord. Well, that's quite a statement. Added to the Lord. All right, that's a participation. When it refers to our baptism, we were baptized into Christ. See? 1 Corinthians 1 9 says we were called into the fellowship of his son. Fellowship as a two-way thing. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says we were joined to the Lord. See, the Lord's a worker. If you're joined to him, it spills over into your life. And this thing is personal. Like 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says God set the members in the body as it had pleased him. See, he puts you where he wanted you. It's like we, this is not on a, like a volunteer basis. Being in the body of Christ isn't like a volunteer it's a placement program. <laughs> it's in Christ's body, remember. And we're called the, the house of God, members of his body, and stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, all of this highlights the fact that there's something for us to do. Now, there's a vast difference between a covenant, like the old covenant, that keeps wayward people in check. That's what it did. See, the old covenant, under the old covenant, nobody was changed. Nobody got a new heart. No one got a new spirit. No one was born again. No one was saved. See, they couldn't because sin had been taken away. So none of this could be done till sin was taken away. So the new, the old covenant, basically, was the bunch of thou shalt nots. There were more nots than do's. And so it was doing it to have to keep, keep, people in check, keep them from going out of the way, see? But that's not the way the new covenant is. Now you, I mean, you wouldn't know that from the things you hear preached in Jesus' name. You wouldn't know that that's the way it is. You'd think that Jesus is doing that now. He's just kind of keeping you from doing this, keeping you from doing that, stopping you from doing it. No, that's not, that's not the nature of the new covenant. In the new covenant, you become a steward. Amen. You say, what's a steward? Well, a steward's more than a servant. It's like a vice president. That's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. It's like he gives you something he's got and says you take care of it, you use it, you employ it. Yeah. You're a vice president. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him, but he, and you're in charge of it. Amen. Yeah, he didn't have that. We had one person operating for God. It was Moses. One person went to God as Aaron. They didn't have the, the people weren't in on this. Yeah. People didn't go in their tents and pray. I'm sure you understand this. They went to the tabernacle and had somebody else pray. They were not participants. See? But we are. Now this has proved to be a very challenging idea to the Christian world. To this day there are people who just have a hard time getting hold of this. They keep thinking about what is it all right to do this? Is it wrong to do that? And that's kind of the limit of how they think. So we want to help dispel that. Now this matter of being in, like you're employed by God to do his work 
This is what frees you from a selfless spirit. You're so busy working for the Lord, see, <laughs> you're not selfish anymore. Your little world doesn't revolve around you anymore. Why? Because God said, think of me, not of yourself. No, it's not quite that simple. He gives you something to do that actually takes your mind off of yourself. Sometimes you could be going down through the valley or on a stormy sea or in a lion's den or a furnace of fire. And you're so wrapped up with God, you don't even notice the environment. You can imagine Daniel saying, oh yeah, I forgot the lions out there. The angels sh shut their mouths. See? But he, was, he wasn't just daydreaming when he was in the lion's den. <laughs> I'm sure you understand that. Now Paul's been laboring to bring the people to see this. and It's no small task. I know how long it took me to see this. And you got to overcome a lot of things to see this. That God's given you something and he, he actually is, we call it, entrusted you with it, but he's trusting you to handle it right. Now he didn't trust people in general before Jesus. Now Moses, he was faithful in all his house. There's a, here and there there were some people who were faithful, but see now in Christ you, you've got something to, to handle and it's going to take all you got to do it. Whatever it is. So he's increasing our understanding of this in his text. Now we're going to be in verse 17 and 18. Another one of those wherefores, you know, it's like an extended, extended thought. Wherefore, be ye not unwise. I say, be ye not, be ye not unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is, and... Be not drunk with wine, where's in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There's a couple, a couple things you can do. Add to see everything else he told you to do. You've got to do it at the same time. Remember, the list of what you're to do is kind of, kind of mountain up, isn't it? Put off, put on, abstain, work, you know, shine, put on the whole armor. See, it's all done at the same time. So here's a couple other things. You don't be unwise. If a person wants to think of it as a commandment, there's a commandment. Now, the people that are commandment keepers, they don't they don't mention this. Ah, they never mention this. Ah, these legalists, they never mention this. Don't be unwise. They don't mention that. But they were going to mention it. Don't be unwise. Be. Be ye not unwise. I remember we've talked a little bit about that, about what, what you be, that, well, I'll make comment a little more on this. Being is what you are, not what you do. Yeah, be. Be ye not unwise. Now, I'll give you this advantage of some of the other versions, which are actually like commentary, someone's comments on it. Do not continue. That's what one version says. New American Bible. You must not be. Notice, notice the kind of it's a different kind of a tone. New Jerusalem Bible. Become not. Young's literal. Do not prove yourselves. We'd say don't turn out to be this way. Stop becoming unwise. Don't be unwise. Don't live unwise. So forth. Now you know that several of the versions they emphasize that they just sing a doing. He, they can't get away from live your life well. That that's not what he said. He said, "Be not unwise." Now, I'm going to say it again: doing and being are not the same thing. You can train a baby eagle to pick around in the dirt like a chicken. You just got to put it with chickens. Pretty soon that eagle's not acting like an eagle. He's really not a chicken, but... See, he could do chicken stuff, but you can't make that eagle a chicken. There's a lot of people that have Christians doing stuff that's not like them. It's like they really are in Christ. Like they really are in Christ. It's the difference between doing and being. We're talking about being... <laughs> 
something you are. See, under the law, this is the law. I'm going to wrap it up. The law in a summation statement is made in Leviticus 18.5 and a number of other places. This do and live. In the commandments, we told you what to do. You weren't allowed to make any mistake. Not, not even one in your entire lifetime. Not even one. You weren't allowed to come short. It had to be done. All of it had to be done all the time. That was the covenant. That was the covenant God made. If you will do this, and it always says it over and over and over. Moses said this and the prophet said it. This do if I'll do this if you will keep all my commandments all the time. See, it? that's the kind of covenant it was. And of course, uh, it didn't work. It wasn't intended to work. But God had to teach men that what he requires of men, they're going to have to have help to do it. And they're going to have to be changed to do it. Or they won't be able. See, there's too much easy Christianity being preached. And nutcases can be Christians. People, lazy people can be Christians. Sloths can be Christians. But they can't be children of God. God particular about this. That's the difference, the old and new covenant. There are no knots in the new covenant. In other words, there's not even a commandment in the new covenant. He says, this is the covenant. This is the covenant. I'll put my laws in their hearts. I'll write them in their minds. They'll be to me a people. I'll be to them a God. No one will say, know the Lord. They will all know me from the least to the greatest. And I'll be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Right, that's the covenant. It's, it's Hebrews the 8th chapter, Hebrews the 10th chapter. Spells it out. This is the covenant. That's the agreement. Yeah. You see, well, how did it get that to happen? Get out of the way. That's how this will happen. Get out of the way. Get self out of the way. Listen to what he said about Jesus because Jesus is your only way to get involved in in that. See, there's a difference. Now you become something. You be instead of do. Like now we're new creatures. That's something you are. That, he doesn't even say, now I command you, be a new creature. Yes. <laughs> he makes you a new creature. Amen. Ephesians 5 eight says, now, once you were darkness, now you are light. He didn't say, be light. Why well, hear these people say, God has called us to be light. Where does it say that? Where is that written? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. <laughs> he didn't say you ought to be. But see, that's been popular. That's, like the, that's their way of addressing the fact they got a bunch of deadheads in the church. So you have to talk like this to kind of get them encouraged, you know. Says you are, you are God's husbandry. Like you're the field, God's you ye plural. That's the whole body of Christ. That's where God's working. If people want to find God, you know they want to find Christ, they want to find salvation. You got to go somewhere where God's working. Yeah, and He's working among His people. In fact, the church is Christ's body. That's where He's at. You are the body of Christ. That's something you are. Our former life is described as what we were. You were. Not you did, you used to do this, although some of that's there too. But he said you were. You used to be something different than you are now. And if you're not different than you were then, like you're not in. That's it. So this, what we're going to talk about here, is not what we ought to be. It's who we are. So we're called being, we've been, we've been washed, that's something we are. We are washed. We are sanctified. We are justified. We are God's workmanship. That's what we are. So it's not, do not be unwise. 
Because some versions say, don't be foolish. I'm going to show you why that, it technically, dictionary wise, academically wise, that's right, but spiritual wise, that's understated. So I'm going to say, don't continue to be ignorant. Don't be thoughtless. Don't be senseless. Don't, don't be wanting in a sense. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish with your lives. Don't live carelessly and unthinkingly. Don't be vague and thoughtless and, un, and foolish. See, that's all. That's different saying unwise. What unwise is saying, you could be wise. Because in Christ, he's been made to us wisdom. So an unwise person is a person who hasn't taken what God's given them in Christ. They're not using what God has supplied. Unwise. Bad stewards. Apostle prayed for God to give people wisdom. Paul wrote to Timothy, the Lord give you wisdom and understanding in all things. See, that's so to be unwise is someone who turned that down. Don't be unwise. The word academically means without reason. They can't think the thing out. They're mentally handicapped, spiritually handicapped. They can't think the thing out. It means without reason, without reflection of intelligence. They, they, can't, they can't process the information. Now you could take one of these titles here, Ephraim, and you could sit down and you could read them like the truth. I mean, this is like the truth you're reading to them. But he can't. He can't process it. He's unwise by nature, so he can't process it. God does not want any of his people unable to process what he says and unable to think about it and unable to reason about it. If, if they come short, he's opened the way so you, can, so you can get the wisdom. Jesus referred to a state, he called it without understanding. He said to his disciples, are you yet without understanding? You still don't understand? Really yeah. The, uh, the word for husbandry yeah. means a cultivated field. Oh yeah, field. cultivated, yeah. I mean, it's a field ready, ready. For, for something good to be done. <laughs> exactly right. Ready for the seed? Yeah, ready for the seed. The fallow ground's been broken up. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's not a... There's a difference between that and a field. Yeah. A husbandry is in, it's in works. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's so the process of uh, producing. That's right. For God. So a husband would be like he got the field ready. Now we're gonna yeah. grow something there. Yeah, that's good stuff. I'll tell you. <laughs> there were other, a lot of times when Jesus was speaking. I gave you some of the references here. It'll say, but they understood not. They couldn't uh, process it. Now the truth of the matter is that the kingdom of God is characterized by a certain kind of, shall I call it, a mindset, a certain uh, mentality, a certain way of thinking. In the scripture it'd be called spiritually minded. Yeah. You had a mind that could handle the uh, things of God, like you could give me a big pharmaceutical manual with all the real bona fide terms and all that, and I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. process it. <laughs> because it takes a certain pharmaceutical mindset to be able to handle that, that book. Well, it's the same thing with things of God. There's a certain mindset, and you get it from God, of course. To those who have such a mind, the things of God make sense. Yeah. Maybe they can't, to their satisfaction, spell it out as detailed as they like to do it but it makes sense they don't have any trouble receiving it yeah. it, may, it makes sense to them that's a special mindset yeah. for instance a person who has this mindset he may know for God so loved the world that's true he might know that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should become to repentance that's true 
They might know that God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's true. The same God is described as pitching a lot of people into the lake of fire. That burns with fire and brimstone. And he's going to destroy those that are ignorant, don't know God and obey not the gospel. But see, the mindset of God, he can, he can handle yeah, that's right. both of those things. Because he knows God doesn't do anything without a cause. God's not unrighteous. God doesn't violate his nature. So both those, what look to be opposite poles, you can process it and receive it. Yeah. Those who possess this uh, understanding are taking advantage of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid with Christ and God. See, they've got this treasury. Let me give you some example of an example of this. Now, the Church of Jerusalem got off to a resounding start. 3,000 right off the bat. The next 5,000. There you got 8,000. That was beside the 120. So you got 8,120 right, right off the stick. In multitudes, both men and women, how many of that was, we have no idea. But you, the mold of the more were added, both men and women, so we are way up in the thousands by Acts 6. And because at the day of Pentecost, devout people from every nation under heaven, they'd come to Jerusalem you know, for the feast. A lot of them were converted and they didn't go back home. <laughs> I could understand why. Well, you can see. So it is created. How are we going to feed all these people? You know, they tell us that Jerusalem with several millions of people would jam in there. So the church, they supported the widows. That's what they did. They must have had a lot of them. And uh, the Grecian widows, they were being neglected. The kind of favoritism kind of broke out. What are you going to do about that? Well, you know, the modern day, we'll call a board meeting. We'll call a board meeting and see what we can do. They didn't call any kind of meeting except to tell what they were going to do. So Peter speaks up. He says, now, it's not reason. We'd say it's not reasonable. It's not, re it's not reason for us to leave the Word of God and save, serve tables. Now, if you were a 20th century church, they'd actually applaud a preacher that left the pulpit to help somebody in the community. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they would now. He'd, he'd be written up. Yes. Right. Well, for some of them, I think probably that ought, their full-time job ought to be out in the community. But they said, it's not reason. We got, we, you're going to have to you know, notice the wisdom. They knew what to do. See, they had this spiritual mindset. Right. We're going to have to appoint seven men. Now, there possibly were thousands. Well, I could see you'd have to appoint like a hundred. There's some churches have like a hundred deacons. I could only imagine. It said seven men. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom and have faith. And we'll appoint them over this business. Now, how did they know to do that? They had this spiritual mindset. They could process. They said, now we know already what we've been commissioned to do, so we know this is not like a call from God for us to leave where he put us here. Yeah. And they were, they had this, they could reason the thing out. That's the type of thing we're talking about. They were not unwise. Now our text B says, be not unwise. It means we're not to be ignorant of the manner of the kingdom. How God works. The end toward which he's working what his ultimate objective is. Why he had to put Jesus between us. Why you got to ask God for resources. See, there's a reason for all this. And the spiritual mindset helps you to process it because everything is reasonable. Learn to navigate in the Word of God correctly so you can uh, comprehend its nature what it's really like and its scope, how much it covers. So you'll read in scripture about the new man connected with you and then you read about the law of sin, that's connected with you. You read about your vile bodies. So here you go. How do I put all this together? Be not unwise. If you begin to think, if you begin to live as though your body wasn't vile, 
and you begin to live as though you didn't have a new man. See? And you ignored the reality the law of sin is in your members. You've been unwise. Be not unwise. You settle that. That's a, that's a commandment. Yeah, remember when one day the apostles, they, they confronted Jesus because they didn't see the reasonableness of him speaking in parables. And they asked him, why do you speak in parables? Yeah, that's right. To the but multitude. He, to the multitude. And, but Jesus told them. He didn't keep it a secret. He said, it's given unto you, but unto them it's not. That's why I talked to him in that's parables. Right. When, they, when he was done, they understood it. And he explained it. See, there are some people Jesus does not want to understand. Yes, amen. He doesn't want them to understand. What he said. He said, I speak to them in purpose lest they should hear and believe and repent and I should forgive them. I don't want to do it. Why? Because they were deserving and he was just stubborn? Oh no. Because these were not that kind of people. God just doesn't dole out his blessings to everybody. And you should never talk to people as though he did. You're some old carnal person, you know, and they have a fallen on hard times, and you say, God's going to work this out for your good. Don't what, say, don't be telling that to sinners. That's family talk. You say, except you repent, you may, a tower may fall on you. That's what Jesus said, you know. He said, what about that tower that fell on all those people? Well, he said, if you don't repent, a tower will fall on you. That's Luke 13, 3 and 5. Yeah. What about those people, Pilate, mingle their blood to their sacrifice? That wasn't right. Except you repent, he says, the same thing happened to you. <laughs> now this resolves a lot of things when you know this. And having said that, you don't want to assume people are in that category. Got to have some good evidence of the art. So don't be unwise. Well, what should we be then, Lord? What, if, you, if we're not to be unwise, that's a commandment. Now, if, if you, right tonight, if you are, would classify yourself as unwise, well, tonight, stop being unwise. Amen. Say, well, how am I going to do that? Well, now enters Jesus into the picture. <laughs> yeah? Now Jesus enters into the picture. The Holy Spirit enters into the picture. God the Father enters into the picture. See? So you resolve in your mind, I don't, I'm not going to be this way anymore. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to have this question mark over my head all the time. You know, used to have cartoons and there was a person who would have a question mark over his... There are some believers, I can see it. Uh, I won't know if they're believers. There are some professing believers. I can see it, they got this question mark. They, they just don't know what life's all about and what to do. What's God's word to them? Don't be unwise. Be not unwise. But... Well, there it is. I like that word, but. Before you move on from that, I was considering in the Old Covenant whenever uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, counseled him to share the load of judging the children of Israel. Yeah. I see that that's a small shadow of that's right. what the Lord has given to us in Christ Jesus because 70 men were given a portion of Moses' spirit to be able to judge that's right. and make wise decisions for the children of Israel. And that's what the Lord has done with us. He's given us the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, and yeah. his wisdom comes from him. Without diminishing any of his. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Amen. But, some other versions read, instead, instead of being unwise. Here, so, it, see, it's just not being not unwise. There's a parallel statement made. So you gotta, you're going to have to pick what, what, unwise or, or what we're going to talk about. The word, the, but, it means nevertheless, notwithstanding, it's an objection, like this isn't the only alternative, or an exception. In other words, this word but is going to call on us to distinguish between what he's going to mention and what he just said. He's going to say there's another option. Be not unwise, but, see there's another, there's another option that can be taken. You think of the but that that's standing in between this unwise and understanding 
you're standing between there, but you got and you can't take both of them. Yeah. You can only have one of these, but in God's kingdom, knowledge is never an end of itself. It's just to, to know what you should do, know what you shouldn't do. That's not enough. What you should do should be done, and what you shouldn't do should not be done. See, it's, it's got, it's got to be translated into into life, actual life. The reason for being able to distinguish between good and evil is so you can choose the good. If you can't tell the difference between good and evil, you will not be able to choose evil, uh, good. How would you know what was good if you can't distinguish between the two? You remember that um, the law taught people to distinguish. Now, it was, it was external things because they didn't have a new heart. And so they were told in Leviticus 10.10 10, to, to distinguish or differentiate between the holy and, and the unclean. You had, you had to be able to tell a difference between the holy and the unholy and the clean and the unclean. You had to tell a difference. Leviticus 11.47 said that it should be distinguished between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. And so he taught them, that's, this is what we call a ceremonial law clean and unclean meats. This situation doesn't still exist, but it was to teach people you have to learn the difference between what's right and what's wrong. You can't be forever asking questions about this. I understand that we all at some time you have to ask, is this right and so forth? But at some point, you've got to grow out of that mentality. At some point, you've got to be able to have understanding and see. Or as Hebrews tells us, Fifth chapter, verse 14, to discern between both good and evil. As he, he's associated with maturity. So don't be unwise, but understanding. Now this every day, it's a big word, understanding. It's a big word. It has the idea like a foundation that holds holds the structure up. It has that idea. Some other versions read, be conscious of, but that's limited because it's just having understanding is, goes further than distinguishing between good and evil. See? It goes further than that. Another version says, be conscious of. That's, that's, too, that's, too, that's too surface, I think. As New American Bible and a couple others, they really go out of the out of the range. They say, uh, "Try and understand. Just try to understand." Now, here's the word: the word "understand" with its kindred words, "understood," "understanding," occurs 25 times in the epistles. Romans through Jude. 25 times you read some form of understand. Now here's, it's a key word. Being lost is described in Ephesians 4.18 as having the understanding darkened. So you can't prove that a person without understanding is even saved. I'm not saying they aren't. I am saying they don't know. If they are, they don't know it. Not like they should. The word understand, here's what it means. This is an academic definition. To set or bring together. To set or join together in the mind. Bring together with the attitude of effect and the ability to comprehend. Under, all right, let's think of it this way. Let's think of it like a puzzle. And the puzzle's all spread out over the table. You understand when you bring you bring it together, see? Into what it, into the picture that it's intended. That's what understanding is bringing, bringing it together. You, in other words, it's being able to arrive at a summation or a conclusion. If you're thinking of it like a think about a motor that's been disassembled and they're all the parts. If those parts are all 
assemble together and the motor runs, that's understanding. See? That's putting it together. That's what understanding means. It makes perfect sense when you think about it. It's being able to put things together. Be not unwise, not able to put them together. Ah. Pitting scripture against scripture and can't figure out who was saved in the Old Testament and who wasn't and all these questions. See, don't be, don't be that way. In the first place, being saved in the sense that we are talking about in Christ isn't mentioned back in the Old Testament. That was, the prophets were told that wasn't for them. That doesn't mean they're all going to hell. It doesn't mean that. It means that they're just... They're not like we are. But you can sit down and try and figure out with Sam, did Samson go to heaven and did King Saul go to heaven and people banner about this stuff and when it's got done? Question mark. God's not going to send anybody to hell that shouldn't go. And not, God's not going to refuse into heaven anyone that wanted to go. Doesn't make any difference when they lived. You think nobody in the flood repented at the last moment? I don't know if they did or not, but I, I'm not going to say they didn't because Jesus went and preached to the spirits that were disobedient. Could you imagine uh, the vision of God coming down and saying, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. He's a perfect judge. Yeah. In Christ Jesus, of course, you have provision for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. See, that's Ephesians 1.18. And you can be filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's Colossians 1.8. So we're not talking about take a lot of schooling or read a lot of books. So that's not what we're talking about here. We've already showed you now that you've been called into participation with God. You're, God's working in you. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. You're in God. God's in you. You're in the Spirit. Spirit's in you. Your names are written in heaven. The way of life is in heaven. So you can get some stuff. Amen. You don't have to be without understanding at all. Now, the lack of understanding is very pervasive in our, pervasive in our day. And I don't mean this derogatorily, and I'm not talking about this class of people that are here tonight. But the lack of understanding is particularly evident in the younger generation of our day. It probably is the most ignorant generation that has been for a long time. It's the fourth Spock generation. And these people hardly know anything about important things I'm talking about about important things. You will hardly find a young person who you're not personally acquainted with that can talk clearly about the things of God. It's just, now I say this because there has been a staggering, unimaginable investment of personnel and of resources and of money in the younger generation. Someone here recently tried to figure it out and he left off in the billions. He couldn't figure it out. How much money people, programs, ministries have been poured in and directed exclusively to the youth and what have we got? Almost zero. Young people have this charge too. If they're in Christ. Be not unwise. You understand. That's your mandate from God. Understand. Now, if you're a 10, 11, 12, there'll be a, there's a certain level of your understanding can get to, but you want to get there. You ought to be where Jesus was when he was 12. Amen. If Sunday night's youth meeting night, and Sunday night there are also some of the teachers that are teaching, where do you think Jesus is going to be? Well, you got it in Scripture where he was. Anyone that's in Christ, this is this is a God's serious about this. Don't be unwise. Be understanding. And whatever you gotta do to get there, do it. Yes. 
You can't have understanding of the Lord if you're ignorant of His Word. Right. That's one thing. That's right. And a person who knows His Word and doesn't submit to it has no understanding. Yes, amen. And mm -hmm. with those those two elements are, are pervasive. Uh, you, a person, you can't attain to this if you're fundamentally ignorant of God. This is talking about the knowledge of God, the experiential right. knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now let's look at this a little closer. Be, but under, don't be unwise now. Mm -hmm. Settle that first in your mind. I'm not going to be unwise. God has told me not to be unwise. Father, help me with this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read the Bible with this in mind. I'm going to listen to whoever's speaking about the Lord. I'm going to listen with this in mind. I'm, I'm going to go about my life with this in mind. Don't be unwise, but understanding. But notice what he says. What he says, what you are to understand. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, this isn't the mythical will of the Lord for your life. <laughs> That's something men cook that up. That isn't in the Bible. Just in case you didn't know. That isn't in there. What is the God's will for my life? It's the same as His will for my life. God told you what, is, what He requires of you. you. Say, well, who should I marry? If you're so dumb you can't figure that out, stay single by all means. I mean it. Do it. Yeah, all the resources are available to obtain this kind of wisdom, so we're not, we're not saying take a stab in the dark. Not at all. Understand what the will of the Lord is. For example, Romans 8, 26 and 27 says that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of God. So he doesn't say to God, Lord, here's what Joe wants. <laughs> he makes intercession according to the will of God. He says, here's what you want for him, but he does. Now, I'm going to spell it out, what that text is talking about. The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He's not talking to you, and he's not talking through you, because it can't be uttered. He's interceding because he knows at this time, there's some things you need, but you don't even know about it yet. So the Holy Spirit says, I'll, ta I'll take it from here. I know that that's not just going to continue on a big basis forever, but that's... That's how God arranged. You've got to understand this. You've got, you've got to expect to be understanding. At some point, you've got to look, look forward to it to actually happening. So the Holy Spirit makes intercession with us for us according to the will of God. And Jesus delivered us from this present evil world according to the will of the Father, the God and our, and our Father. So he delivered us. This is what God wanted. Deliver the people from the world. Make it so that they won't be in bondage to the world anymore. That's, what I, that's son, that's what I want you to do. Deliver them from this present evil world so they're out of the grasp of the world and the world can't weigh them anymore. Amen. Well, did Jesus do that or not? You'll never know until you're in him. <laughs> but when you are and you fellowship with Christ, you'll find out you've been delivered from the world. Amen. You don't have to kowtow to it. You've been delivered from it. And like, who cares what people think about it? That's the way it is. Delivered by the will of God. One good brother prayed for the church at Colossae that they might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. How's that? How's that for a prayer? Perfect and complete in all the will of God. And then uh, our adoption was according to the will of God. Predestinated unto adoption according to the will of God. See, so the will of God, this is a big item. Every, everything in salvation is what God wants. And what preaching the gospel and laboring the souls helped is to teach people that they can, they're only authorized to want what God wants. What God wants to give, to be more precise. That's what they want. And understanding brings that to you. Do you are you aware that 
there are a lot of Christians that there's all the resources that are available to you are available to them also but they don't know it nobody's told them they've just told them they preach from Sinai they just told them well you ought to be good husbands you ought to be good wives you ought to be you know so, well yes we certainly go along with that but how can you walk with Christ and be a bad husband I mean how See, salvation is real, brethren. It has real resources, and it's wrong to be ignorant of them. Everybody should be discontent to his, who is ignorant of them. God's people are to be able to put all this thing, all these things together. As they read the Bible, things should be like coming together. Pretty soon, you see the whole picture. What the will of the Lord is yeah that's an important word it's a two letter word but it's important what the will of the Lord is <laughs> so it's already in place God's already doing what he intends to do it's just the only question is are you involved are you participating that's that's the only only question but it's a great deliverance when you when you get this is it's a great deliverance when you say look what God wants to me it is not way down there it is what the will of the Lord is what God wants for you he's prepared for you it just remains for you to be not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is what does God really uh, what does he want from you it's good to ask yourself the question to work it out in your mind work the thing out what does God really want well you could say such things as uh, well, he wants me to be ready to die. <laughs> You're going to die, right? <laughs> he wants me ready to face the judgment. If I'm part of the church, he wants me to be ready to be part of the bride of Christ. <laughs> so so it, you know, if you think about it, you'll know what God wants. So when you understand it, you commence working toward that yeah. end. All right, don't be unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is and be not drunk, be not be not he doesn't say don't do, he said be not remember now this is uh, all in order that you might understand first you got at the front end you got don't be unwise, here's the understanding then he puts on here right, something else you got to address there's something not to be if you want this understand the be not be not, be not drunk. Some versions say, do not take over much wine. That's not what it, let me be clear about this. That's not what it says. It talks about excess in the next phrase. I know we're, not, we're talking about be not, be not drunk. In other versions, Yeah, it says don't overindulge. That's not what it says. What, is, what does it mean to be drunk? Be drunk. Well, in a brief word, it means to become intoxicated. Well, what does that mean? Intoxicated. It's stupefied to the point where physical and mental control is markedly diminished. So when you're drunk, your capacity to think is reduced. Your capacity to control your body is reduced. And everybody knows this to be the case. But just it's good to think on this now. And to cause someone to... The Oxford Dictionary says drunk is to cause someone to lose control of their faculties. That's what drunk is. And he's going to say with wine. But it's, it, it doesn't mean other kinds of drunkenness are all right. Like induced in a super by drugs or whatever drunk so state of mind state of state of per being where your mind doesn't function and he just said you got to understand what the will of the Lord is so if your mind isn't functioning whoa you're you're yeah. tremendous jeopardy be not drunk with wine now wine literally means the juice of grapes. That's the literal meaning of it. Now the Bible commentators and so forth are by no means agreed on what wine means. 
they've been fussing about this for like hundreds of years and they haven't, they can't agree, so I'm not going to enter into the fray and try and provide a precise definition. Yes? Something that I was um, considering is also if you, um, if you drink too much, then you die. You can die if you consume too much. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, most uh, etymologists agree that when you read the word wine, you can't assume it means fermented. They, they all pretty much agree. Some do assume, but they say it, they know it's an assumption. You can't assume that it means fermented. Now, why do you say, why do you say that? Well, some people say it's all right to drink wine. You just don't drink too much of it. And they use this text. And 1 Timothy 5.23, drink, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities to substantiate that thinking. You, it's, not, it's not wrong to drink wine, but it, it's wrong not to drink too much of it. All right, now I'm going to submit if that, if that is the right way to reason. <clears throat> Nazarites, who made a special vow to God, were not permitted even to eat a raisin. They could drink no wine and, or strong drink. They differentiated between wine and strong drink. Whether it was fresh grape juice or not, they couldn't drink it. That was the law. Remember when the angel appeared to Samson's father and mother? Said he was going to be a Nazarite and they told him, you can't. Got to raise up this boy. He can't eat a grape, he can't drink grape juice, he can't eat a raisin, he can't eat anything that comes from a grape, he can't, he can't do it. When the priest went into the tabernacle, the law specified, no wine. When you enter in this tabernacle, not even a sip. No wine. Solomon, he's instructing, uh, or Isaiah was taking a prophetic ministry, and he said the priests erred because they drank wine. I mean, that's just what he said. Solomon, he's instructing his son, and speaking of fermented wine, here's what he said. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself. It's a bubble, see. All right. Don't even look at it. Now, you shouldn't have to be, sit in a classroom for a long period of time to know that the least you can get from this is wine has a, has a flag danger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Yes. That's, that, that's the least conclusion you can come to. Caution. You're toying around here with a snake. Be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess? Now I'll tell you why it says excess. Wine, particularly new wine, in a non-fermented state or early fermentation state, if you ingest it in large quantities, the fermentation takes place in the stomach and the person becomes drunk quite a while after they drank the wine. That's what happened to Noah. That's why in excess, what it means is you may think it's not affecting you, see, but the effect of wine drunkenness is after. It's after the thing. Be a drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Now someone says, yeah, but they thought the people at Pentecost were drunk with new wine. That's new wine. Yeah. Not old wine. The fermented wine's old wine, it's not new wine. Well, that was because they didn't understand what was going on. I doubt that they were staggering around. See, some Pentecostals do this. They call it being drunk in the spirit. This is, a, this is what they call it, being drunk in the spirit. They're staggering around. Yes, and these people at Pentecost weren't staggering around up there. They had full control of their faculties. They hadn't lost them. 
So no, that's not the type of drunkenness. Peter said, these are not drunk as you suppose. It's just the third hour of the day. But listen, they were saying, they had full possession of their faculties and understanding. They were delivering a God-ordained message. I imagine they were ex so exuberant. Their religion, probably their synagogue was so dull to see someone excited made them think that maybe they were drunk. Well, that would probably happen in a lot of places today. Same thing. Now, <clears throat> This, there's another form of drunkenness that exists in our day. It exists among the, in the charismatic movement. It's called baptized with the Holy Ghost or slain in the Spirit. And it what causes people to lose their capacity to think. And sometimes it lose, they lose control of their body. And they think that's a blessing. No, they really do. I tell you, these people are slain in the spirit, laying on the platform. These people aren't preaching to those people. Yeah. Uh -huh. And those people down there, they aren't preaching to anybody either. See, they've lost their understanding. It's a form of drunkenness. Yeah, right. And lo and behold, it's in the name of Christ. Yeah. Oh, I got one even better than that. I maintain that the modern praise movement is a form of drunkenness. You got to just be in one of these to see you got to be able to see when the preaching starts and stops and when the praise starts and stops and you'll know what I'm talking about. Sometimes kids that are really laid back, they get almost wild, man. They get jumping off the platform, jumping up in the air. These are the kind of things drunk people do. And it's actually a form of spiritual inebriation and intoxication. And you just can't minister in that kind of an environment. I've known people that have tried. They just, you just can't do it. See, be not drunk with wine where there's an excess. That introduces a principle. Don't you do anything that causes you to lose your rationality or ability to think things out. Amen. Don't do it. Well, what should we do then? <laughs> be filled. Don't be filled with wine. See, as wine, the more wine you take, the worse, out, worse you get. The more spirit you have, the, <laughs> the better you get. <laughs> See? Yeah. It's a different kind of filling. Amen. Now, he doesn't say get filled. Some people say, I got filled. He said, when you got filled? When did you get filled? He says, be filled. Yeah. Is that what it says? Be, this is like all the time filled. Yeah. Be filled. It's a prolonged, that's what you, what you are. You are a filled person. Not a person who was filled, a person who is filled. See, be filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit, of course, is for the new man. It's not for the flesh. So the Holy Spirit's not for the flesh. You say, well, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Yes, they are, but that's because that's where your spirit is. Tell you the Holy Spirit is dwelling in your spirit, not in your body. And your body's a temple because that's where your your person is housed. Think of yourself as this way. Think of your spirit, or perhaps your heart. Think of your heart as having many different rooms: the thinking room, or well, there's the determination room, the purpose room. Your heart's made of many different rooms. The Holy Spirit is to fill them all. Amen. Sanctify all your capacity. So whatever you're using your mind for, the Holy Spirit is impacting that area. Be filled with the Spirit. Every form of expression, let it be dominated by the Holy Spirit. And I've lived long enough to know things that come out of your mouth that you wish didn't come out. I mean, I know that. Holy men of God would lay this out, lay my hand on As a Job said, I lay my hand. And sometimes, I've had to do this. I, I have to confess, I have to I had to do this. Sometimes I didn't do it in time. When you feel you're going to shoot off your mouth, physically stop your mouth from talking. And you'll find the Spirit will give you something. Be filled with the Spirit. Why? 
because your mandate is understand what the will of the Lord is and if anybody knows what the will of the Lord is it's the Holy Spirit Amen. and he'll show it to you he will he'll show it to you he'll say here's where God's headed now does what you're doing fit into that is this activity you're engaged in or whatever is this going to make it easier for you to die or harder? Is this going to make it easier for you to stand the day of judgment or harder? It's No one can do this deciding for you. You've got to do this. But see, this is a call for people to do this. Amen. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And it isn't you understand it Monday and then you got it settled so you go about other things. you got to live in the awareness. God's told me, he said, I'm going to burn the world up and I'm not going to give a lot of advance notice. Yeah. Okay. If you're not ready when that happens, you're out. It does not. Changes the way you live, doesn't it? Be not drunk with wine. We're in his excess. Do you notice that there are certain activities that the longer you submit yourself to them, the duller spiritually you get? You, You'll pick up on this sometimes. You, you can sense you're like something's like a, a whole bag with holes. There's something, something that I need here is leave. I can sense it's leaving. That's being unwise. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close there. I mean, if you have something you'd like to add, it's a, it's a great text, brethren. Hope I didn't absurd it to you. <laughs> Thing has to do with being strong in your mind and able yeah. to keep what the Lord's given you good. long enough to be able to put it all together. Yeah, that's good. Someone who is immature and, and not wise, it's like they lose the things that the Lord gives to them, yeah. so then they can't assemble them together to be able to see a bigger picture. Yeah. Good. Uh -huh. Amen. Yes. Yeah, this thing about your having your capacity diminished, it's a foolish thing for a, a, someone who had to be delivered from a pit to think that they can actually manage something that diminishes their their capacity mm, all good because they, they you know yeah, it's good. just like a it's just like a deception yeah. they think well i can handle it i can for me i know what i can handle i know what i can take but see you've already been deceived yeah. if you think you can yeah. do that this is good yeah i can see that if anything causes diminishment it can't be controlled that's why it causes the diminishment I thought about this when you were talking about the way that people reason concerning this. This is another example of, of, uh, of thinking about things. Or what, is this wrong or not? This isn't the way we should think about it. Thinking, yeah. Is this right? Is this going to give me yeah. the advantage yeah. in, in running the race itself? Amen. Is this of faith? Because if it's not, then, then it's, it's sin. sin. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think that you can really establish that someone who wants to go about uh, proving that it's okay to do this has a, a godly ambition in doing it. The, the, it from the very beginning, the yeah. question is loaded. Amen. Yeah, when I... Come on, have something. The, Lord, the Lord's not going to share occupancy with the flesh. Hey, that's, that's right. good. Amen. Well said. Amen. Yeah, and that's not only just with one, that's with a lot of things. Oh, yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. The Spirit can occupy. That's right. That's just an example. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that man out of whom he cast the devil? But no, nobody moved in. Yeah. Yeah. And he went out and got seven more worse, so it, the situation was worsened. Yeah. 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 Since he is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. That's a very that's well said. Yeah. It doesn't have occupancy, but the that's you can see that in the gospels. Yeah. Go ahead, Sister Maddie. Yeah, I was reminded of the account of Jael and Sisera. And oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not always whether or not you drink wine or something like that. Sometimes it's just a matter of when you let your guard down, like drinking warm milk yeah, that's right. that's if you're in the heat of the battle. <laughs> that's not the time to rest, to yeah. relax. Yeah. That we see what happened to Jail, uh, or to Cicero, because he yeah. didn't maintain his, his guard. 
I don't, uh, maybe you brother have heard a lot about this, but I don't hear a lot of people talking about this, about being on guard and being alert or vigilant, as the Bible says. It, it doesn't seem to be a lot of talk about this, although the people of God, as soon as you talk about it, it all makes, it makes perfect sense, because your adversary, he like God doesn't go on vacation. So everything is against you, they're working full time. And everything in heaven that's for you, they're working full time. So, but if you're working part time, <laughs> well, you've left doors open. See, it's like your hard many rooms, some doors left open. But it's just... Someone that I knew had a conversation with someone who said that when they they were weak when they first believed because coarse jesting and and inappropriate talk it bothered them. But now that they're strong, it doesn't bother. Them. Oh, yeah. so that, that's another example of drunkenness. Yeah, they <laughs> drunkenness that's mis right. Misdiagnosed it. Amen. <laughs> Boy, that's very excellent. Yeah. Yes. Being unwise, we wouldn't um, want a person to, um, if you had to have heart surgery done, you wouldn't want a person, just anyone, come in and do it. You have to have the knowledge on how to do it. You can't just read a couple of sentences, but you have to go, you have to labor for it in order to know how to do that. And God will, um, as it was said earlier, God's not going to, um, He won't allow people who choose to remain ignorant to work in His kingdom because they won't get anything done. That's right. See, the devil can use ignorance. He can't work with your understanding. He can't take away your understanding. It's, a, it's important to know this. What you understand, Satan can't take that from you. But when you're ignorant, he can take a... Oh, yeah. yeah. When you have understanding in you, it, it stops the devil from doing what That's he right. wants to do in you. It's a stumbling right. mm -hmm. See, the devil doesn't have understanding either. Everybody understands that. He knows his time's short, but it's made him matter. That's right. He doesn't even understand it. Uh -huh. he, he can't learn anything. A devil can't learn anything. Yeah. You can say, I guess we showed the devil there, boy. We even showed the devil. He can't learn. That's right. He has come back and belts you again. Yeah. That's right. He can't learn. See, but, but you can. Yeah. Amen. You can learn. <laughs> yes, Brother Paul? I was talking about... Uh, the women on Pentecost, I was reminded of the uh, issue when Robert Cohen was brought back to Jerusalem in the time of King David, and uh, he was dancing with his ephod. Yeah. And Michael, uh, Michael uh, scorned him for that, and he said, I will become more vile than this. Yes, yeah, right. He, and he was very well aware of what was going on. That's yeah, right. He, he wasn't was, drunk, was he? And he knew he was going to do some bigger things. Like yeah. This. And then he went on to say, I will be honored for it. That's right. <laughs> That's good. Well, he's asked you if the fire of the Lord consumes you, the zeal of the house of the Lord eats you up. People may think you kind of slipped a cog or two. <laughs> yes, Jonathan? think about the parable Jesus told about the man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on sand, no matter of wise and unwise. Because they was the wise man, he thought about the rain. So he like, took that and it kind of like, well, if I build it here, this will happen. So I need something for it. That's right, that's right. Point being unwise, when a person's unwise, they frequently put themselves at risk in some way. And it's always due to ignorance. Good. Yeah. Amen. Very good, brethren. We have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the provisions you've given us that not only do you tell us to be understanding, but you've given us the means to obtain that understanding. And we're, we're grateful for it. In fact, Father, many of us have received a considerable amount of understanding before we really saw that you were the one that administered it. So we give you thanks for that time when we were not as understanding as we should have been about the sources. We thank you have given us some understanding here. Yes, ask that you would help us to always seek understanding when we don't have it. Always be ready to acknowledge it and that we're discontent. 
with ignorance. And we know that this type of request is well-pleasing in your sight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.